So welcome to our our uh, Vicky session on Haiti, and thank you all for coming. Um, a number of Burlington residents have gone to Haiti, and we wanted to bring them together uh, to talk about their experiences, especially since the earthquake. And uh, we want to start with these images. If you want to just tell about uh, what these represent, I'm mm -hmm. going to turn off the lights. Okay. Then I'll turn the lights back on and we'll see. Sure. Move the cameras around. Okay. Barb okay. Lesson. Hi, everybody. Um, Why don't you go up there, Barb? Okay. Oh, goodness. I didn't quite prepare for this, but. Um, it's dark. Yeah. It's dark. You can't see me. That's all the better. Yeah, right. <laughs> the microphone is there. So no, 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 no. We're using it, right, Chris? Okay, so these images were taken, um, well, the exact year of them, I think, was between, somewhere between 2011 and 2012. I can't, uh, they're, they're a smattering of images between the 2010 and 2013. I think that's probably the best way to put it. You'll see pictures in here that um, are of Port-au-Prince. Um, they go, we go into Duchetti, which is in the Grand Anse. You'll see pictures of the mountains. We were in Kenneskov which is above Port-au-Prince and above Petchenville, for those of you that are familiar with Haiti. The Grand Anse is the most remote part of an inaccessible uh, part of Haiti. Um, Duchetti is a, a place where the Vermont Haiti Project people have um, a project going on, so I was uh, you know, uh, up there a lot with them, of course. Could you say about that project? About the Vermont Haiti Project? Yeah. Oh, what can I say about it? Well, what is it? Well, the Vermont, Vermont Haiti Project is works with a local uh, Haitian uh, who lives in Port-au-Prince. They, they met through medical, UVM medical people up there doing relief work. This is all goes way, way pre-earthquake. Uh, and they formed relationships and kept those relationships and helped those families out, raised money for those families that they worked with. And uh, the Duchetti is where their family is from originally, uh, before they migrated uh, to, uh, to, I'm sorry, to Port-au-Prince. Uh, the gentleman who they support, his name is Despan. He, uh, he uh, wanted to start a school up there. So they were working towards that end to acquire land and build a skill school and all of that. And I know that they began work on that school, but I don't have any pictures or I don't really have an update on their project. The pictures you're seeing here are from the Haiti Circle of Friends project that was in Haiti for uh, three years uh, ongoing. And these are all people that participated in the project. It was a volunteer-based project. That's all the white folks you see running around. And uh, they flew in, and this certainly doesn't represent all the volunteers that went to help uh, help children and women in particular and families in general um, to overcome uh, the issues of being uh, torn away from your fa their families, children being torn apart from their families due, due to extreme uh, poverty. Um, what occurs in Haiti and is becoming more and more well known in Haiti, hello, it becoming more, uh, more. I guess I'm reading lately that it's becoming more uh, of a general practice. People are getting more hip to the fact that there are children who are not orphans and they do need home, homes and they do need support and they don't have social uh, 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 um, human service and family um, uh, social structures, uh, support from the government to help their families in Haiti. So they must depend on people from the outside to help them. And I guess more and more people are turning towards this, I guess it's, I'm not going to say we started this model because I, uh, I don't imagine that's true, but I can say that it, we, we were very innovative with this model of child care when we did start with Haiti. And if it is true, in fact, that there are more people that are uh, using this particular model for care for children, they will all better as far as I'm concerned. So uh, these pictures are here right now. This is on, um, going from Port-au-Prince. We stop along the way before we get to the city of Lakai and head up in, uh, head up in over the mountains uh, to get over to Duchetti. Uh, we stop for a break, and these guys were just uh, a whole bunch of them were fishing. So I put in a smattering of daily life, volunteer life, people working, uh, trying to make money, bringing in food for themselves and to bring to Lakai. Uh, to sell, to support them, themselves and their family. Uh, you can see uh, pretty uh, wild the way they're still working with uh, these, this netting system of gathering the fish. Uh, soon after this, you'll see a little bucket of, I don't know what kind of fish they have, those little tiny things, you see the little white things. 
Uh, hi, Doreen. Uh, so this is all of these people here um, gathering uh, the little shrimpies in the bucket, and uh, one of my favorite photographs. So um, there is some of most of these are my photographs. There's a few. There is a little segment that are, are not mine. They were taken by a volunteer, and so it sort of gives you the idea of what it is to be very rural and live a very rural life. And you can see how this is self-sustaining here with food. And you can see, we'll see if you haven't already, when, it's, when it uh, loops around to uh, being import prints um, for the um, uh, how people are growing their own food. In fact, we had a project called Farming for Families, and where we rented a big piece of land, a big plot of land, and started gardening, and everybody gardened. And in fact, in point of fact, we did so well with that garden that we were actually selling food to another uh, house that was uh, farming and taking care of children. Um, at a reduced cost to what they may have bought it for um, in the marketplace and better quality because it was picked that morning. So, but not the, most food is fresh and meaty anyway, so, uh, so it's not really a huge problem. So that's really all I have to say about this. Um, you'll see pictures of the earthquake. I've got some in there with some of the damages. There's a, a place in there, and here you'll see it's obviously, obviously a presidential palace where the whole dome is uh, toppled forward. Um, you know, I was very pleased to, to read that uh, Robin and I had spoken uh, in depth about Haiti many times, but particularly relevant to this presentation, about the notion of the ongoing revolution of Haiti, because Haiti's revolution way back in the 1700s or whatever uh, certainly uh, was never really fulfilled to the benefit of her people. Um, so this gives you a little insight into Caesar's father and his son, uh, families that are literally torn, torn apart by extreme, extreme, when I say extreme, I mean extreme poverty. And um, and there we are in Duchenne, a little, you see in my little sack, we've got Annie, my puppy, who is very famous in Haiti, and cheering people up along the way. And here we, here we are, and just kind of take the images in and you hear other people talk about their expertise and, what they know about Haiti, and um, this is just really meant tonight to provide a, a visual background to the uh, the uh, sharing that uh, other people uh, might be able okay. to give us tonight. Well, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So here we are again. Welcome the others who came in. And um, what I would um, like to do before we, we, everyone, we start sharing uh, our experiences, and I think this is a good uh, start to see the images of, of uh, Haiti. Um, and over here is a timeline, OK? And uh, <laughs> I made this for our. Um, discussion back at Champlain College uh, a couple of years ago, and it only went this far, and so I added the rest of the years, but as a person who got to know Haiti through, um, through the art primarily, and the music and the religion, um, as time went on and I went back several times, the politics became very all-consuming, as it was all-consuming to the people there. And I got to know Jean Bertrand Aristide, or at least I interviewed him in his office when he took office in 1990 for nine months, when he was overthrown by Cedros, and then he came back into office and, and for a third term, and he was again overthrown in 2004. <coughs> And when I interviewed him there, it was so moving because it was, he said, we have 13 years to, to, um, to bring education to all the children, to bring health care, and to present Haiti to the world on the 200th anniversary of the Haitian Revolution. He was really abs absorbed with that. And so were many people, they were planning special uh, boat trips that would go from Africa to uh, Brazil to Haiti to show the, the way in which um, the slave trade had worked and that Haiti was, uh, in fact, something like a third of all the uh, slaves that came to the New World came to Haiti and were used in 
a horrible way in terms of the uh, uh, sugar industry and cutting the sugar cane. So, um, so anyway, that shows that, and then we know that after, shortly after the earthquake, um, a guy was elected, selected, more or less, to run the government named Marte, Martelli. And then there was a, another election, and this guy, uh, Jose, I keep forgetting how to say his name. Jovenel Moise. Yeah, Moise. Moise. Moise is now uh, refusing to step down, although revolutions in the street have been happening since last February, which is when I was there, and I documented my little story there, how I couldn't get to the hotel I wanted to go to and spent the time at a wonderful sort of rustic uh, alternative tourist center. Um, and that's sort of the, what the situation is right now. For example, it, it's, it's terrible. It's more than terrible. There was a story about how a guy who sells trinkets got, got a loan for $150 to be able to put uh, things on his table for Carnival. And then Carnival was canceled because of a variety of reasons, apparently not the coronavirus, but because of conflicts between the police and, and the army and so on. So this poor guy is meant to pay someone back and has no money, and so people have no money, and they're trying to trying to live and feed and uh, feed their children. <coughs> so that's just a uh, general general discussion, general overview, um, and uh, so maybe maybe um, Julio could could speak to us. Julian Portillo from Champlain College has been there more recently. And uh, <coughs> we have a map here so that you can tell us where. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where, where it is that you go? Sure. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, I think if you come up here, that would be good yeah. for the camera. Sure. Yeah. Can I ask a question? When you're talking about Haiti now, uh -huh. what is the attitude of the United States? What's going on between the United States and Haiti? Well, Trump supports this guy, Moise. Um, the people are angry because Moise has used the money that was provided by obtaining gas and oil from Venezuela. Yeah. And uh, part of the deal was some of the money that the government made by selling that gas would be used for the people's needs, and it wasn't. So he has not admitted that he committed anything wrong so far. And, but the people are just adamant, and that's why the picture that I used on the uh, publicity shows a Haitian man waving a Venezuelan flag, uh, because they, they support Venezuela, and Trump made Moise uh, join the, the, the countries against Venezuela and against Moderno. So the people said, what? You're asking? You're, we've received the gifts, in a sense, of oil from Venezuela. Now you're saying that our country is joining the gang against Venezuela? Does that make it clear? Is that and Guaido, so, you mean? Huh? Is that the alternative, do you want to call them that, to Maduro, Guaido? In, in other words, the United States is urging them somehow to deal with that guy that the United States supports? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Trump has been pressuring all, uh, all of the Latin American countries yeah. to support Guido right. instead of Moderna. Yeah. So the people say, no, we've been receiving the, the generosity of Moderna all this time. How can we turn against right. him? But maybe you've met more of this. So let us know what you've experienced. OK, great. Well, thank you for having me, Robin. Sorry I was uh, late. I got hung up at home with the kiddos and 
carry the kind of a little later than I thought. So apologies for um, my delay, but it's a pleasure to uh, see you all. My name is Julian Portilla, and I work at Champlain College. I work in the uh, Mediation and Applied Conflict Studies program there, and I teach uh, several classes um, a year at Champlain, and I also actively work at mediating things in lots of different places, mostly Mexico, uh, where I was born and where I'm from. I work a lot with fishers and, and, um, and NGOs and governments trying to find ways to make fishing more sustainable in Mexico. Um, and, and I also happen to work uh, in Haiti because um, as part of my work uh, as a mediator, I am on a roster of mediators um, that the, there is, um, you, you've all heard of the Inter-American Development Bank. It's a multilateral bank composed of uh, all the member nations in, on the continent. So there's 26 borrower nations and then several more lender nations. So the US, Canada, um, Japan, Korea, uh, the European Union are lender nations. But also the Latin American countries, the, the same borrower nations are also lender nations. And so, the Inter-American Bank, like most of the big multilateral banks, lends money for big infrastructure projects, for public projects. Um, so it's where if a government needs money for an airport, or uh, an industrial park, or a mine, or an energy plant, or something like that, they go and they borrow from the Inter-American Bank if they're on this continent. And so that's, that's their, their sort of mission, public infrastructure, basically. So then a private bank, in the sense that they're, they're not lending money for you know, business ventures uh, exactly. They're, they're kind of an infrastructure bank, and they're they're member owned, if you will, <laughs> but by national governments. It's sort of a, a community bank to the Americans. Um, now, as you can imagine, that bank has all kinds of policies and politics internally about how to lend money, who to lend it to, and under what conditions. Um, and they have, like all the multilateral banks, the World Bank and the African Bank and uh, Central Asian Bank, East Asian Bank. All the regional banks, they have a certain set of safeguards uh, and, and policies that they oblige the borrower nations to comply with. So in other words, if you're going to rip a road through a forest, you have to do some mitigation work. If you're going to um, put a mine next to a community, you have to do some mitigation work. If you're going to put a mine uh, or a, a dam on Indian land, you need to figure out how you're going to engage the Indians in the community process and find out how you're going to address the damage, let's say, that your, your project is going to cause. Um, and so there are safeguard policies at all these multilateral banks. And if those policies are not followed, then communities affected have the opportunity to ask for a redress process from the bank. In other words, they can say, we think your policies are not being followed by the implementer. The implementers are always governments. The bank doesn't implement projects. The bank lends money to governments when the government makes the things. Um, and then the community who is affected by these things has the right to say, bank, we don't think that your implementing partner is doing a good job. So I got a call uh, a couple of years ago to go to Haiti because um, after the earthquake, there was a lot of conversation about uh, how to help Haiti. And of course, there was all the disaster relief stuff and so forth. And, and you know, one of the biggest misconceptions about the disaster relief in Haiti is that while uh, tens and hundreds of millions of dollars were pledged, very little of that was actually ultimately delivered by the people who pledged it, including the United States. Um, but one of the conversations that was going on at the time was how can we make Haiti less dependent on Port-au-Prince? Port-au-Prince, like a lot of um, Caribbean and Latin American countries, it, uh, Haiti is a very centralized place, and so everything starts and ends in Port-au-Prince, and whatever sort of economic thing you may have going on in another part of the country, sooner or later, something happens within a port of prince And so the idea is, how can, how can, how can we pull people out of port of prince uh, people looking for different opportunities, people looking for work? And uh, Hillary Clinton and, and Bill Clinton ended up um, negotiating a lot of favorable terms for Haiti to export um, uh, clothing, basically, to the United States from Cap Haitian. Cap Haitian is a pier. And Cap Haitian, for those of you who are Haitian history buffs, was uh, a central part of the revolution um, that was promised was never fulfilled. And, and I don't remember if you said that or, uh, or um, if you said that. Um, in any case, in Cap Haitian, um, they decided to get uh, money from the Inter-American Bank. The Inter-American Bank, in this case, donated money. It's not something they do often, because they're a bank, after all. Uh, but they gave 
um, about $500 million to build what they call an industrial plant uh, on land in near Capation, um, so over here. Um, and that factory, or that industrial plant, displaced a group of farmers. So there's about 400 farmers farming on land around this river that feeds out into the ocean. Um, and it's, uh, it's a really important source of water, of course, as you might imagine there, and it led to pretty fertile land. But the studies of the bank, for whatever reason, or the, or the Haitian government, rather, said that that was the place for the industrial plant. So they laid out an industrial plant there. And in so doing, they forcibly removed the farmers from farming on that land. Um, they didn't live there. But it was, it's what they call economic displacement in, in development terms. And so these folks were economically displaced because they couldn't work the land that they'd been working um, for years and years. And as a result, the Haitian government, as it turns out, in the Haitian, Haitian law doesn't allow for compensation of land if, if you are displaced by the government because it wasn't the farmer's land. They were, they were paying what they call farmer's rights to the government to work the land. But they didn't own the land. So by Haitian law, they didn't have the right to any compensation. But of course, they've been farming there for years. Uh, and Haiti is a food insecure nation and a net importer of food. Uh, and so to lose farms in a, in a rural part of Haiti um, is a tough uh, blow to sort of local agricultural and you know, food security stuff up there. Uh, the bank, and or rather the bank, but the government of Haiti tried to find land to replace for these farmers, and for a variety of reasons, couldn't do it, and so they end up compensating the farmers with cash payments. The bank policy says if you uh, displace people, you should not pay them cash, <laughs> because that's not a way to restore livelihoods. Uh, like any of us, if you lost your job and got a bunch of money uh, for it, that'd be great for a little while, uh, but after you paid your debts and maybe bought something extra and paid for a couple funerals and uh, a trip to Port-au-Prince to see your aunt or whatever, uh, that money's gone. And so you can't restore your livelihoods with cash. Or rather, um, it's a, it's, it, would be, it would be a challenge to do so. So some people did buy land with that cash settlement. Um, some people bought small businesses um, that they continue to work today. Uh, others bought small businesses that didn't work out. Um, and so this community got together, and they filed this complaint with the bank, and they asked the bank to come and mediate. And so for the past two years, or three years now, I have been mediating between the bank, the government aid, and the farmers on proper compensation, or at least the follow-up to that compensation plan, which the focus of which has been to restore the livelihoods of the farmers. Um, and so at the moment, we came to an agreement at the end of last year. Um, and so this year begins the implementation process, or rather is the, we came to an agreement um, in December 18. And so all of 19 was the first year of implementation. This is the second year of implementation. And the political turmoil that Robin was making reference to made it very hard to do any um, Real serious implementation, just because um, it's very hard to move anything when the, the, the actual um, approach of the political opposition to Joe and Belize was to shut the country down. They said, you know, we're going to they look, we're going to lock the country down was, was the term for it, and they did. Um, kids couldn't go to school, people couldn't get to hospitals, can't go to the store, no goods, moving in and out of port prince and for the first time in a long time, economically speaking, the country is going to have a shrinking economy for the first time in a long time. So this, this terrible standoff is at real terrible political costs. Um, and that delayed, of course, our implementation process up north. Um, but yeah, that's kind of an overview. There's a, there's a lot more to say, but <laughs> that's a story. Pardon? Did the factory actually happen? Oh, yes. Yes, the factory has been there for a long time now, uh, close to seven or eight years, seven years. Uh, and we target uh, and other big box stores receive lots of uh, Hanes clothing fabricated by South Korean factories on the industrial plant that was financed by the bank built by the Haitians. So the plant, as you can imagine, is just, it's just infrastructure. It's, it's um, you know, cement, water, electricity, buildings, uh, security, fencing, uh, that kind of thing. And then, and then it's up to private industry to come and, and build a factory on the plant. Uh, and so the South Koreans, who made the first factories there and made a deal with the Haitians and the Americans to put the plants, or their factories, their garment factories, on this plant. And then being on the north, of course, it's easier to get to Florida, and so shipping costs are low, and there's preferential imports um, and, and tariffs for Haitian goods coming in from that plant. And uh, I am not a big defender of mega development uh, by any stretch, but it's worth pointing out in the name of fairness that these plants do 
provide about 13,000 jobs in an area where there were none. 13,000 jobs at minimum Haitian wage, which is about $6 a day, uh, not a great, um, you know, not a lot of upward mobility in those jobs, they're factory jobs. Uh, however, if you multiply six by 13,000, um, that's a big amount of money every day, every week, every month. Uh, and so it's a, it's a big influx from a macroeconomic perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm channeling the, the bank's arguments here. I'm not necessarily defending the position of the bank, but that's the, that's the argument. Sorry, you want to say yeah, what was the deal what, that you, you that the fireworks came to? The agreement that we negotiated with them? So it was all about livelihoods. Uh, and so the deal was, um, if, if you imagine 400 units of uh, people eligible for compensation, uh, imagine that each of those 400 units gets two tickets. And one ticket is a job at the factory for anybody in your family. Um, that doesn't sound great, but um, the, the folks who were involved were, were actually fairly talented to be able to get to the front of the line to be able to get an interview and to get a job at the, at the peak. It's called the, the Parc Industriel de Carco. Um, the peak. And, but let me just finish out the, yeah. the, the shape of the agreement and then have any more questions. Um, so that's one ticket. The second ticket is any a number of, of the following options. You can buy land, and the government will pay for it with bank money. You, if you bought land and you want to improve land um, and you want some better harvests or yields or production or, or um, if you want to find better ways to take your product to market, there is um, equipment and uh, technical advice on that side of things. If um, you want a scholarship to, get, to go to the trade school locally, you can do that. Uh, if, you, if you are in what they call a very vulnerable segment and you neither can farm nor want to farm nor have uh, skills to go and get training and trade, you can do what's called a graduation program. So um, this is with uh, a sort of Heifer International kind of program where, where you get some animals and you get uh, some home improvements, so either a, a roof improvement or better access to water. Um, and then after six months, after some training, if you choose to go for microcredit, you can do that. But we, um, everybody was very clear that we didn't want to make people go further into debt right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So there was a sort of initial asset uh, giving and then, and then, should you choose to go further, you can on the micro credit scale. And if you qualify for your graduation program, in other words, you didn't uh, kill off the chickens or the, or the goats that you got, uh, and you uh, maintained a certain uh, attendance level of trainings and so forth. Oh, there's also a stipend for that over the course of the six months while they uh, build up their skills and their animals so that they can have enough to either. What are their demands? Well, the demands for a long time were to restore the livelihood. So that's, that's why they got the conversation in the first place. The demands now are, can you please do this? <laughs> so implementation has been extremely slow. Uh, the Haitian government is very difficult to work with. And, and while they've all agreed to it, the bank has agreed to finance it, getting it done is another story. And so that's why I continue to go. Uh, and we have twice monthly calls. And three times a year, I go down there. And we're trying to sort of make things happen. It's just tricky for any number of reasons. So am I understanding correctly that seven years and it's still not a fully functioning program? Mm, more or less. You want to get into that. Let me ask you well, answer your question and answer that question. Well, I've heard Robin speak a lot about kind of the criticisms of the Clinton government yes. about Haiti. And, yeah. and I'm not exactly sure. Do you want to address that? What, what happened with Clinton's? Well, okay. the, the Clintons have known, <clears throat> gone to Haiti for many years. They went in their uh, honeymoon, right? Uh, during their honeymoon, yes. And Not in Moscow, Moscow, but Haiti. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so they, they like Haiti, but um, I think there's been a lot of criticism since the earthquake that um, the Clintons haven't They've, they've stepped forward, but they haven't stepped forward uh, effectively. Um, others, so many other people have come. I mean, you know, Mark Leslie is just one of many that went down there. Sean Penn uh, went down, and according to the book by Amy Willits, has done a really good job as a celebrity actually creating a camp for displaced people, uh, which you know, the idea of a camp is to help 
displace them again mm. back to their homes or finding another home. Mm. And he worked out a system where um, what she approves of. But the Clintons seem to have gotten a lot of uh, a lot of criticism. And, and what do you think of them overall? Their, their well, impact? I think they placed a lot of eggs in the Jean Bertrand their speed basket. Um, yeah. And I think they were the primary motivator for coming back the third time. Um, yeah. and, really? uh -huh. and I think that by that time, it wasn't, it wasn't a very good choice. I think I think that I think that largely because of him, Haiti has gone back to a system of warring gangs mm. uh, who are fighting for power and the security apparatus. Which because of Aristide? Uh, largely, it, it, yes. I mean, Aristide was certainly a facilitator. That it's an old tradition of Haiti that goes back to Duvalier to have warring gangs fighting against one another, and, and um, it is in the absence of a real state funded and run security mechanism, it's what people turn to. You turn you turn to private security, which ultimately turn into gangs, it's sort of a paramilitary force. So so in the absence of a coherent state force, that's what happens. It's it's, it's uh, you know it's kind of Hobbesian in that sense. Are you saying when he came back uh, in, uh, in twenty eleven, right after the earthquake, that's when he returned? No 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 I'm sorry. Oh, Looking at your timeline here yeah. I found uh, a, a oh. very, very useful. Um, where's the yeah, in, this guy? Two thousand yeah. 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 Uh, so it predates that big earthquake, the first earthquake. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, was there before the big earthquake. Uh, actually, um, Preval, Preval was there during the earthquake. Yeah, he's the Green Line. So Preval was before uh, Aristide, and then when he Aristide was overthrown in 2004, there was a hiatus there and a, and a caretaker government. And then Preval came again, and Preval was a Supporter. I mean, he was a candidate of Lavalas, which is the name of Aristide's um, mm -hmm. movement. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what's sort of surprising to me that Preval, who was a modern and progressive person, was in power for so two long terms, and yet, well, then he he was there as the earthquake. Fell and the yes. White House fell, and he died shortly thereafter. As I understand. well, he finished his term. He, he's one of the, I believe, he might be the only modern Haitian president to have finished his term without getting booted uh -huh. or assassinated. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then died shortly after that. But but he finished. Yeah. Um, to your question, seven years. Why, why and now and and, and um, you know why is it taking so long? So the first compensation process lasted about four years. Um, and then there was a hiatus, and then they filed a complaint, and the bank took it up three years ago, and then and then we finished the agreement at the end of, of 19, to give you a sense of the timeline. Yeah. yeah. What's the uh, situation with security now? Yeah. Right. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. It's it's really really bad. It's in, it's in flames. So it's it's terrible. Okay. Yes. Haiti, Haiti, so the question was about Haiti security situation, and, and it's really really awful. Um, well, you, were you? Well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't um, catch the beginning of the presentation. When, when were you there? I, I went to Haiti uh, right after the earthquakes, and I was there for almost almost full time for till 2014. Okay, great. In and out. Yeah, yeah. So you can only do. Yes, of course, yeah. right. So the situation since this, uh, since the, the protests and the counter protests have started, has been is really bad. So for about a year now, it's been it's been terrible. It it sort of lightened up for a little while. There was a bit of a um, an accord. There was uh, some attempts at dialogue. The UN was very active trying to get some dialogue together. That has now collapsed. Uh, and the opposition, who had once agreed to only protest on weekends and to let the country go back to normal functioning most days. Um, is now sort of on the fence about what they're going to do. Lots of kidnappings, lots of violence. The president himself, Jovenel Moise, is accused of, of having killing squads going across and, and making targeted killings, especially in the countryside. Um, and the, the political class in Haiti is about as bad as it gets. Yeah, it's bad everywhere. It's bad here. It's bad uh, all over uh, Latin America. Really bad in Latin America. And in Haiti, it is, is, you know, it's as bad as it gets. It's terrible. The, the opposition is terrible. Um, the, the parties in power are terrible, the security situation is terrible, it's, it's maddeningly uh, and heartbreakingly poor. tragic and poor. Yes, I mean, it's one you know, top ten poor countries in, in the world. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really tough to spend time there and uh, have your heart bleed out. 
because it's a it's a really tragic situation. Yeah. Is, is, is Paul Farmer still working there? I mean, that, I don't know if Paul Farmer's still working there. You know, June could answer that, but she. Yeah, she, I'm pretty she, sure. Yes. Is, is, is it? Yes. His, okay. His institution is. Yeah, part of the. Part of the hospital up in the countryside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's no, uh, a friend of mine's mother had breast cancer. And they didn't know about it. We hooked them up to go to Partners in Health, and oh, she's in the mission now. So it's and this is from the last year. So okay. it's still, there's still, I mean, it, it's hard to do anything about it. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, that's still a function. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. I've been to his hospital. It's beautiful. Is it? It's, it's amazing. It's, a, it's this beacon in the middle of uh, uh, nothing. It's up on the mountaintops? Yeah. If, 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 if you remember one of those slides, it sort of looks across the valley up into the mountains on the other side. It's yeah. really essentially like right over that way, but you can't, you have to go down and around and up and over and to get there. But, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's very state-of-the-art, uh, very community-oriented. It's um, w w really interesting. They had like, one of the most interesting things I remember about it was like where the air conditioners there, they had like um, bacteria zappers. Oh, cool. So, it, so when there was like people, all these people coming in sick, there was, as, as people may know there, uh, the UN peacekeepers brought cholera epidemic to, um, yeah. To Haiti as well, okay. and um, so there's tons of very sick people, and so they to keep the air. It was very. They had big rooms like this where they were connecting to doctors in the states, so they they could learn from them or carry out the procedures together. It was it was, it was really quite uh, impressive endeavor. Mm -hmm. And it continues. That's really yeah. Cool. It's still there. Oh sure. Yeah, that's great. Oh, yeah. There's a very, very good book um, that I found really helpful to orient myself with to Haiti, which is called um, the, the Truck That Went By. Uh, it's about development aid in Haiti after the earthquake. Um, yeah, and I'm yeah. laying on the other thing. I'll look it up on my phone in just a second. Yeah. Jonathan Katz. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh. So Jonathan Katz. Yeah. Excellent book. He was a, he was a, was it Reuters or AP he was working He's AP. Yeah. So he was, the, he was the local AP guy, the Associated Press guy in Haiti. And, and, great storyteller and it's really jaw dropping a lot of the stuff that he talks about. He touches all the way from the earthquake to Preval to, uh, he talks about Chantin, he talks about Garakul and the factory that I just mentioned and he talks about, um, I don't remember if he talks about Paul Farmer, but he certainly talks about cholera quite a bit. Yeah, and actually the, the cholera at the dinner, well, the UN does get bad rap for that and, and yeah. in a lot of ways deservedly so, it was actually the waste disposal company that was pulling waste disposal out of the UN compound and rather than treating it appropriately, was just dumping it into the, the stream, the nearest stream. Which, by the way, in Haiti, this is very common of, anyway. Yeah, well, the, the level of, um, of desperation in Haiti, I, I always find it uh, shocking to, to, to share with people that there are two water treatment plants in all of Haiti. One, one in this industrial park <laughs> to treat the industrial waste, and the other at the other industrial park in Haiti, down in Port-au-Prince. That's it. Well, that, that equals the number of psychologists that they have there as well. So. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, trash disposal, no. non-existent. No. You know, the rivers are choked with trash everywhere you go, uh, and it's, 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 it's desperately miserable. Deforestation. Uh, on a massive scale, like you can't believe. I mean, if you just look on a Google map uh, picture, like a, sa a satellite picture, you can see the line between the Dominican and Haiti, mm -hmm. not because you can see the, uh, the border guards standing there with their uniforms, but because one side is stripped clean and the other side has lots of forest. And that, by the way, if you ever read any of the, um, the stuff by Jared Diamond and, and Collapse, uh, he paints a really interesting contrast between the Dominican and Haiti where um, through their own brutal dictatorships in Haiti, yeah. or in the Dominican, made the very conscious decision to go with some environmental conservation and some, some forestry management uh, to preserve water and to create other eventual industries um, for the Dominican at the cost of human rights and brutal targeted killings of, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, what do you call it? No, um, we call it people who cut wood. Um, Loggers. Loggers, yeah, thank you. So, so illegal, lots of illegal logging in these very valuable forests. Beautiful old tropical woods, you know, hardwoods, um, uh, mahogany woods, you know, really valuable hardwood stuff, rosewoods, all those kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. That on the Dominican side is still there, and on the Haitian side got, got stripped clean because of the, the need for carbon, for, for coal, for um, charcoal, rather. Uh, and, and 
And so the sort of um, subsistence agriculture and the need for charcoal ended up stripping all the trees on the Haitian side. Because um, the Duvalier like, regime was never interested in figuring out what to do with their natural resources. They just wanted to pillage. The Dominicans were doing plenty of pillaging and at the same time had somewhat of a plan uh, that uh, as a result of their really heavy-handed dictatorship and uh, killing a lot of people and saving a lot of forests. Uh, not, not, not the ideal way to do conservation in my view, but um, there it is. So are the natural resources that they're using in the factories up in the north part, are they, is it, they're grown there in Haiti? Uh, the, at the, the factory pretty much just needs water, and so the like. What are they making? Oh, they make um, they make clothing and they make paint. Actually, is the other thing. They have, uh -huh. they have paint factories and clothing factories. So where do they get fabric? Good question. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I doubt it. I very much doubt. Uh -huh. it. I bet they import it from Malaysia or Bangladesh or something. Uh -huh. I'd be very surprised if it came from Haiti. Is the port functioning that is right near there? That was the, the other idea that they would be really developing a an alternative port to for the Prince yes. up there near the uh, uh, new factory. But I was yep. reading something that said that that hadn't happened. So if that hasn't happened, then how how do they get the the clothing to uh, yeah. the fabric to make into clothes? To Florida, right? Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that, Robin. I, I, if it's not, they'll just put it on a truck and send it to the Port of Prince, which defeated the purpose of having it up there in the first place. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I can tell you that the Port Authority uh, in Haiti was recently stripped of the privilege of managing the ports in Haiti. Mm -hmm. because, of, because they got caught doing, um, taking too much off the top for themselves and their cronies. So that has been stripped away. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, the one, so, you know, you say what you want about multilateral banks and uh, big infrastructure lenders in general. Uh, the policies of the multilateral lenders and the safeguards are, for the most part, far better than the national legislation of the countries in which they work. Which means that the standards that the, the implementer nations have to achieve are, generally speaking, higher than their national standards and that the laws are obligated to. So, so, for example, the transfer of the ports to another authority was at the behest of the bank, who said, this isn't working, and we're going to withhold the next disbursement of this loan unless you transfer the authority from the ports, from those guys to these guys. Uh, yeah? What are some uh, valid criticisms of the Inter-American Bank and similar mm -hmm. and multilateral banks with respect to AA? There's plenty. There's lots. <laughs> There's lots. I mean, uh, you know, you can start with the basic conversation about the development model. Uh, and that's really the big one. So, so what is development? What is progress? How to fight poverty? Um, you might argue that the sort of idea of mines, dams, and roads uh, is a little bit outdated in terms of uh, how to make for a stronger social fabric uh, and how to provide for self-sustaining, self-driven development ideas. Right? And, 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 and actually, right at this very moment, uh, last week, this week, and next week, the bank is consulting people all over Latin America about their new policies. Their new policies are better. Um, and so on the face of it, people say these policies are better. But then when, when they invite indigenous groups, and they always invite indigenous groups for specific meetings, credit where credit is due, the indigenous criticism is always, uh, we don't want what you're bringing. Uh, we don't want what you're building here. We don't want your road, we don't want your power plant, we don't want your mine, we don't want your factory. Yeah, we don't want that stuff. Is there a disconnect, essentially? Yes, yeah, so at the moment, the bank's policy uh, is on rights to people who are forcibly displaced. One of those rights is not, I don't want your project here. It's not, it's not, just, it's not to be able to say, I don't want this here. That's changing in the modernization, they call, that's what they call the modernization of the policy framework. And at the moment, that's changing to where there has to be a consultation and there has to be a conversation. It doesn't necessarily give you the right to veto yet. Um, it's a little bit soft in that regard, but it's better than what it is. And where there are indigenous lands concerned, you, you have to abide by a whole bunch of UN conventions. The International Labor Organization has this convention. It's called 169. You hear about it all over Latin America because it's a big deal because it's the one international legal instrument that obligates you to uh, have free prior informed consent to uh, projects on indigenous lands, which gives them the right to say no. 
Lots of criticisms are available of the multilateral bank. If you are of the idea that you need roads and hospitals and electricity to reduce poverty, then it becomes a very difficult conversation because you know, I do believe those things. It's, it's very hard to live without electricity and, and not have refrigeration and not have hospitals and not have uh, uh, roads to get your goods to market and to bring things to you and the, you know, all the things that, that young people want because we've seen them before. Um, at the same time, the price that you pay for that uh, form of development can be very high. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's these constant trade-off questions. Uh, and I think contemporary development is an endless series of difficult trade-offs. I guess um, for those, I, I suppose everybody here knows a little bit about the history of Haiti, right? The, the, the reason why I think it is so kind of colonized by European powers from the beginning is that Haiti was a, a slave country, right? Yep. Built on slavery. It was a French colony. Yep. And in 1804, the, the slaves rebelled and had a revolution and created the first black republic yeah. in the in the Americas really. And ever since then it seems to me that it has been really exploited by the capitalist powers. Yeah. Um, and still, right? Still. Yeah. And I think and I think that a lot of what's happened in Haiti is because it stood up against France in eighteen oh four and has been trying to create its own society ever since. Yeah. Yeah, you can say that uh, the big colonial powers have been being paid, paid ever since. Ever since. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a it's almost cumulative, you know? Absolutely. One might, one might argue that the, the, the Haitians are complicit in this as well. Why? Well, and, 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 and so I think, too, I mean, I'm certainly not a supporter of colonialism, but having, <laughs> having said that, I mean, I think this hits on the essence of an unsuccessful revolution because when Toussaint mm -hmm. Uh, attempted to, uh, with uh, the uprising of uh, the Haitian people uh, back, well, I don't know, the year, was it 1804? Yeah, I was trying to beat Joe Napoleon out, I think. Okay, so, uh, and, um, I mean, he, he basically, uh, he, he became a, a European in his own right and, and began to conduct the, the politics and the government in the, uh, in the image of, uh, of the, the French people that they just uh, would just boot it out of the country. Uh, and so, and it just seemed to me it, from, from what I've read and seen that uh, it's, just a, it's just perpetual a reenactment of um, coming to power. Let me put it this way. I went to somewhere, where was I? I think it might have been a hospital or something. It was a, a public place, a government kind of public place. And I walked in and the whole wall was filled with pictures of presidents. I mean, the whole wall. There was probably 30 pictures on the wall of people who passed in and out of power of Haiti. Yeah, it's that was the never, last 20 years, right? I, 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 <laughs> it's never, it, it, it's, the government that was established after that has never righted itself to treat its people yeah. properly. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't. Um, That's often don't, the legacy of, of co uh, colonization and, and, you know, mimicking the, the model that existed. and. And it didn't work. It didn't work. Well, still isn't working. Well, what happened to our speed in the end? Wasn't he kidnapped by the CIA? Uh, he got, well, eventually the United States turned against him. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how he ended. I think he, I think he left for the country. Well, Robin did. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I would disagree with you that I don't think the United States was ever for him. I, I know. mean, I, they, yeah. they were intensely yeah. embarrassed that he won the first time against uh, Marc Bazin, who was a World Bank kind of guy. And everyone was totally surprised that Aristide got 67% of the vote and more people turned out than ever before in Haitian history. And then he was overturned in, in, in nine months. And, it, yeah. and you know, the US was behind the people who ran the coup. And uh, yes, uh, and Clinton brought him back uh, by helicopter and deposited him on the White House. Of, Port au Prince, but that was under pressure, and and Haiti could and uh, Aristide could only have to fulfill his five years. He you know, he didn't have the extra time that he was out of power to add on. He so he could only be in power for like what is it two years mm -hmm. there, and then um, uh, and then Preval came in, but he had to make deals with. Clinton in order to return, and one of the deals was to privatize a number of the industries, mm -hmm. which he tr 
pretended to do, I mean, it was a, obviously a very fraught relationship. I mm -hmm. think he didn't satisfy the United States uh, when he came back. And, uh, and Preval took power, and then he, and then believe it or not, Aristide won again in the year 2000. What happened then? Then, um, then things got really uh, difficult because some of the elections were challenged, uh, mainly for the senators in the legislature and, and so on, and the United States uh, put sanctions on. I'm not uh, quite sure how complete those were, but it really crippled the government and uh, crippled um, what Aristide could felt he could do in terms of implementing more schools and so on. Uh, and then, and then the United States supported a bunch of ex-military people in the Dominican Republic who were armed and swept into the country and swept around the country and came to Port-au-Prince and, um, and sort of kidnapped Aristide and put him on an airplane to Africa. Yeah. In my recollection in the 90s, the way Aristide was portrayed in our media, yeah. I mean, it was particularly harsh. I mean, they, there was almost like a soft allegation that there was you know, something that he had psychological challenges. Mm -hmm. It's almost yeah. like what they did to Castro. But I mean, I'm just saying in terms of, you know, the way he was portrayed in our media here, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then it went kind of back and forth, it seemed. I mean, that was just my, my mm -hmm. recollection and impression at the time. It wasn't particularly, you know, praise, they weren't particularly praising Aristide mm -hmm. for some of the, uh, Items that you note here in terms of accomplishments in mm -hmm. education and healthcare, as well as other other areas of, of social. And I think he was challenged with, you know, uh, uh, permitting drug uh, people to come in, but actually that the flow of that. I mean, the uh, I think Mart Martelly really had more mm -hmm. um, much deeper connections, say, to the Cali cartel, and after that. Drug, drugs circulated from uh, Haiti to the United States in a real flow after 2004. So it's been a really uh, a difficult time. Hey, uh, Aristide came back in right after the earthquake and uh, has lived in pretty quietly, mm -hmm. it seems. But he does run a university uh, med uh, medical school and people graduate from it, and I gather he has a close relationship with the Cuban doctors that mm -hmm. come to Haiti. Um, so in that sense, he's quietly doing good work. Yeah. But Jesuit. keeping a very low-key profile. Isn't he a Jesuit priest? He was he, a priest. He, he, he gave yeah. that up uh, at yeah. some point, yeah. and you know, got married and has kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two daughters. Yeah. He lives in Tabar, which is about a 10 minute drive down the road from the airport, maybe 20 minute ride. It's kind of flat land, there's a big old gate in front of his property, and that's about it. You don't see him around other than that's where our lives. <laughs> now, uh, John, you've been quietly sit over here so that, sure. so that the camera can hear your voice or, or stand if you want. But John has also been to Haiti, and uh, yeah, tell us your story. So, uh, John Rasmussen, I also teach at Champlain uh, filmmaking. And I was in Haiti from 2013 until 2016. And I was, this here. For two years, I was in Lakai, uh, which is right here, it's in the South Province. Um, I, my experience, it was, I can't work with nuns. I have a long experience working with nuns here in a program like AmeriCorps. Mm -hmm. And the nun that ran it, they were based in Baltimore, um, and they started, they had a nun that originated from here. And they, so their program, they were like, hey, do you want to come down? Um, and we, they had a center in a slum in Lakai, in like the lowlands. 
uh, like the Hurricane Matthew went right through here all the way up, but it really, you know, it's the most expensive land, like any place, it's the, the highest point in that area. Anyway, so I went down there and I was teaching filmmaking at this community center. Um, and we made some pieces. Um, and I was there two years, and my last year was in Bluebirds. Um, and in terms of like major, I don't know, it was a wonderful experience. I was there in a time, I mean, incredibly poor. Um, but it was also a time of political stability. I was in the sweet Mickey years, and uh, Martelli. So he was the famous musician who became president. Um, and it was, it was, it, I mean, the stuff that has changed, like it was very, very safe. I never, and Haiti is very safe, especially um, if you're my color. Um, and it, it's, it's safe for Haitians as well. When I was there, it was in terms of security, uh, the diaspora. Haitians lived in the States or in Canada and Europe, but they'd come back sometimes, especially after, after the earthquake. It was problematic. And now it's, as Julian was saying, um, the last time I was there was in, I go back uh, before the trouble, I was going back like twice a year to make videos with, the, with these dogs who started a bakery um, in, the, in the slum, and, you know, small time employment, but it was, it was a, it's a cool economic endeavor. Um, and I was doing stuff to promote, but it just in, in terms of, Security, it's just people that I know that that are in Port Prince, and you know they're from the slum. They're being kidnapped. I mean, it's gotten really bad. It's not you know the, the diaspora anymore. It's just it's so desperate, and it is like when I was there, when it was you know during that chunk when it was stable and, and very very safe to do to do anything. I got around by riding a motorcycle, and I would uh, you know I, I had great trips just around the country. And easy, and it was uh, it was never. I was never stopped. I was never harassed by the the police or just by the uh, the shemer, like the armed people, the militias that go out. Um, but it has been, it has deteriorated. Like the where, where's the money is the slogan in terms of the, so the patrols. It, it is now, and it, it's very dangerous just for people. Like, to, it was, as Julian was saying, it was shut down. Um, like, the bakery, the, and this is just a small thing on a large scale. Like, it's just everywhere. It was, everything was strong. Because everything does run out of poor prints. So, for example, you know, this small bakery um, that employed like 20 people, everything comes from poor prints, so all flour. Because there is a port in Kai, but it's it is it's so central. So anything, any any fuel that that was one thing. The tap tap system of Haiti is you know you're covered in diesel after you know uh, fumes after riding you know the tap taps. But that was shut down because and it's kind of it it the crisis in a sense started when the fuel price was raised. Um, uh, it was like overnight. And it was the international, but they, and they decided, okay, it was like double. Mm -hmm. And it started this crisis because that's how everybody gets around. There's no, the public transportation of these pickup trucks with great paintings. And once those, one, that really started the rumbling because oh. that affected everybody, like the, the T. Marchand, the, the merchants. Um, they can't, they have to get to the market. And you live a long way away. And so, and then it was then the embezzlement of the money that was the, su the subsidies for Venezuela, it came out. And it, it is really just in terms of, I was scheduled to go in October and it was bad in the summer and it kind of got better, but then it was you know, this dark, dark, dark times right now. And it's, yeah. it's really, really sad. Like schools were closed for six months. Why? Because of the because the, the current president Jovenel Moyes, the banana man is his nickname. Um, he they wanted to leave power, and I, the, the thing is, if he leaves power, I don't know what's after that. Mm -hmm. He's not a good guy. He's he's bad news. But what comes after yeah. him? I have no idea. In terms of there is no 
the structure, and it's it's really if he does step down, um, you know what comes. The Parliament is a meeting now. No, yeah. wait a minute, Robin. Is that right? That it, yeah. There's not a Parliament. It's not in session, or it hasn't been called, or they haven't because of the protests. No. It, well, or that's a. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't have an election. Uh, and so a third of the parliament left the building, uh, and they don't have a quorum to call a session. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea, in theory, was that that would allow Jovenel Moise to raise a new constitution and, and put the house in order, because the constitution is actually fairly weak in terms of uh, on the executive, and so it's very hard as a president to do anything. Uh, assuming that you want to do anything, yeah. uh, it's very, very difficult. And so the idea is that he would launch a new constitution and a new kind of constitutional convention, but that has yet to materialize. So it's a failed state, more or less? Not yet, but I don't know. That's a good question. But <laughs> it depends on how you define it. What do you think? Uh, I, I mean, now there, I don't know. It, it is held together, but it's, I mean, I don't know. It, it is so weak. Yeah. It's just Moise. And after Moise, uh, there is not, there's, there's not a structure in terms of, the one thing is, in, in during the, the UN is now gone. When I was there, they were there for the first two years, and then they left. Why? Um, well, I mean, they've been there forever. They were like an occupying, but the one thing that they did, and this was like the militias, the, the Shemer, like were you, and I, kids that I knew that would come to my filmmaking classes, um, I saw pictures of them on YouTube with guns because some politicians in the area had armed them. And these, these, they don't, you know, I mean, they're just, you know, neighborhood kids, incredibly poor, but, you know, some politician came out and they had, you know, they had automatic weapons. Um, automatic weapons. Yeah, automatic Well, it, And it is kind of like, you know, to, to arm, and, and it, is, it is a political crisis. Um, Are there local governments? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there is, and it, it all is, is, you have like a mayor, if I was in, in Kai, and they, they fund that, and there's, a, there's a provincial government and stuff. And the government is, it's like a Kafka novel, in a way, in terms of bureaucracy. Haitian bureaucracy is incredibly mm -hmm. complicated, um, and just to get insurance for a motorcycle is... Uh, <laughs> It's so a who's wild kid, ride. Who's kidnapping people and what are they doing with them? I, that, that's the thing. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what the, they the must. Get, yeah, but, but whatever little money they have, they, they don't. They don't have money, or at least the the students. Maybe they think they have money. But the students. The student goes to um, an IT school in Port au Prince, so it's a university. But I mean, they're terrified. And this is. And these are students that were out. They were going. Terrified. Terrified just to um, to stay out after dark. Mm -hmm. Terrified to go to school um, mm -hmm. because of the kidnappings and especially the dark. Thing. Like the one huge thing with this IT school, because school was closed for six months, they had to catch up. And you know the students had all, you know there is no public school in Haiti. And this is university; it's yeah. private, but everything is paid school. Um, and so you paid your money, now you gotta give it. So okay, we're gonna have like super intense classes. But the students kind of revolted because it's very dangerous. And like tap taps, the the pickup trucks that, that are public transportation wouldn't run because of the danger of of robbery. Um so what I don't what can they get? Maybe a cell phone? Everybody has a cell phone. Yeah. Um that's maybe that's some that's pocket that's money or you contact the family. And then the family maybe ponies up. And then do they, what do they do with the people they've kidnapped? Um, like my experience with kidnapping, which is very rare, and this, is, this was like a French, I knew a colleague of hers was kidnapped for a while. This was like in 2015. She was held for a while. Um, Jesus. I think f until she worked for you know, French NGO, I don't remember the name, but she was released and she said, you know, it was fine. She was, they gave her a toothbrush and toothpaste and food. She was really scared, but they, I don't remember how much they asked for. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, yeah, I mean, bad things can happen. And, and that's a different story with outsiders, with the blonde, with, with 
the that that's a, a different level. But yeah, I mean, it, it is a, it's very desperate. People are very desperate. Like the, there was a huge uh, influx of Haitians to Chile about two years ago, three years ago, and it was like there was Chile. They do now. They the visa you could come. There are certain countries that Haitians can go to. And so it was like a gold rush. Everybody was going to Chile. Um, and I, and every, people are desperate. Like if you ask, you know, on, to like, what do you want to do? All Haitians want to leave. Right. Because, and then when, and, and so like the Chile thing was really big. Chile eventually stopped that. They, they, you know, there was and like those xenophobia. And they went to Chile, then they migrated north and now they're on the Mexican they are yeah, yeah. coming to the you had some in the yeah. USA. Yeah. In Mexico, in Mexico? Yeah. yeah. The, the people who had gone to Chile, have, many of them have then gone to Mexico to try to get in the US. And they can't, right? Right. And this is open to you also. I mean, has Haiti always had a market economy? Have they ever experimented with any kind of socialist reforms? Or is that something that we kind of frowned upon? No. I mean, as far as I know, it was, it was plantation economy, kleptocracy, yeah. Yeah. chaos. <laughs> OK. Yeah, I don't think there was ever enough organization to do any kind of socialist experiments. Yeah, OK. Well, on the, on the grassroots in the, in the countryside, there's this something called a combite. A combite. Yeah. And you'll see pictures of that. Of, uh, it's everyone getting a hoe and hoeing the uh, the earth and yeah. putting the seeds in together as a group thing. Mm. And that's an aspiration, I think, amongst the people that, hey, let's, let's join in a combi, let's have, let's make it work. And to my mind, that would be one of the hopes if, it, when it, when Haiti hits rock bottom, that people will look at those um, sort of uh, forgotten institutions of the of the countryside and uh, try to in, in, institute them again. But it's from the bottom up. It's not top yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Was it the net exporter? Yeah, the importer of food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. They import their food. From how much? Um, wherever you know, all over the place. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Well, how much of the land can be? Is I mean, that like, like the factory took away farmland, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of like overall picture of a health of an economy yeah. um, is not part of the criteria that the bank uses. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, think, I think if question. you ask the, uh, an economist at the bank, they would say that the 15,000 jobs that you made outweigh the loss of the 400 farmers. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you can talk about cultural questions, you can talk about the collective thing that Rob was talking about, and, and, right. and, and the real critics, the head critics say you created a food crisis where there wasn't one before. Uh, right, well that's just, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, understanding what the implication was on food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, now, now you could also say how much, how much can 400 small, I mean, no, yeah. none of the farmers had more than four hectares, which is like eight acres. Most of the plots were about, you know, an acre, acre and a half, two acres. Yes. Yeah, micro farms, uh, typical, like, um, you know, self-sufficient, or not self-sufficient, but what I'm trying to say, um, you know, where you feed yourself. Sustenance. Yeah. yeah. But the, the, the issue is also that every Haitian has some sort of plot of land, or most mm. Haitians have some sort of plot, so they can, they can subsist on what they grow and whatever extra they can grow they can sell and they can get extra money to buy whatever they need to do or to bring yeah. down to market. Uh, a lot of the pictures that are in there of the market <coughs> scenes are just those are people that have a small piece of land and it can be a quarter of the size of you know, just this much of that room and yeah. it's next to their house and they work it and they often, very often, you work together. It's difficult to work that land. It's very rocky mm -hmm. and it's very hard. It, it's um, it's not like Champlain Valley soil by any stretch. Um, so I think that to take away 400 farms is a very, very big deal. I remember it being a very, I was there when it was all, all coming down and it was not a popular notion in the country at all. So you take your $6 a day, that brings a family $1,300 a year. So you have to ask your question, how far is $1,300 getting the Haitian economy? 
And I'm here to tell you, Haiti's expensive. Yeah. It is? Very expensive. Like in terms of rents and stuff? Well, fuel for one fuel. is the big one that's gone up that was the most accessible cost. That's expensive. Uh, food is expensive. Diapers, uh, if you're going to get these things, any kind, any kind of, what, anything you buy here, you can buy there. Fine, sooner or later. But it's all, it's, it's, it's basically out of reach for most, most people. If yeah. you go into the doctor, is expensive. Huh, it's not socialized medicine. No, oh my God. Funeral is, is ridiculously expensive. You wouldn't believe the funeral costs in Haiti. The funeral, there you go. But it just, this is incredibly important. In 2013, like, it was the exchange rate was like a dollar for 50 good. And yeah. like now it's around a hundred. Oh, wow. So it's, I mean, it, it, and the, that has and inflation. Is like inflation is, is, is just, it's, it's awful. You but, see, but there uh, are some very uh, rich uh, soil lands in Haiti, like the Artibanac Valley, which mm -hmm. is north of right. uh, yeah. north of Port-au-Prince, and that's where rice was grown. And for a while, Haiti was self-sufficient in rice from those farmers. However, then trade policies were set in, and I'm not quite sure thing. when that happened. But um, Miami rice was Miami in, in, imported into Haiti, mm -hmm. and it undersold their Artibonite mm -hmm. rice. Mm -hmm. The farmers went out of business and had to leave and come to the and come to the capital. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know the the um, progressive uh, organizations even believe that the efforts that were made by AID and others to uh, reforest uh, the tops of the mountains and the farmlands uh, in the rural areas with forests was a scheme to force them out of their farms and back into and, and into Port-au-Prince so they could work in the sweatshops, you know, mm -hmm. to try it. So that there was a feeling that there were efforts being made to to uh, find workers for the sweatshops and to depopulate the countryside. Now, I don't know to what degree that's, that's actually what happened, but um, I mean, I know that happened, but whether it was planned that way or not, uh, but certainly the, the Miami rice was, uh, was a big uh, uh, deterrent to self-sufficiency, and also the Miami rice is um, uh, has uh, is sprayed with uh, what is it? The Miami rice is very uh, low in certain um, uh, vitamins, and it was it was, fade, it was given to people in the uh, prisons who got very sick from it. So it's been a sad story all along. So I sort of remember in the 70s, um, Haitians going to Germany for medical education, for university education. Germany? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so there must have been something in the 70s that was a, a rise in where the country was going, that they were sending university students out for education. And they were being paid by the government to go They were to getting education. Say education, stipends, but, but maybe by, by Germany. Yeah. Um, but there were, there was, um, what, you know, my little window was just this, um, there was an opportunity for university students to get education um, outside the country. So, so how that then sort of crashed back on itself. Uh -huh. Well, the 70s was doing the time of Papa Doc, and then Papa Doc died towards the end of the 70s, and Baby Doc took over right. until 86. <clears throat> and part of the reason why um, there was such a big groundswell against him was because of the swine flu mm -hmm. uh, issue. And um, I made a film, it's not on this film though, mm -hmm. but it's called uh, Haiti's Piggy Bank. The, um, the pig that a 
uh, farmer or, or a rural person uh, had was in a sense that person's piggy banks where he could he or she could access cash if there was a crisis in the family or to send the kids to school or something by um, killing the pig and selling it or piglets and so on and so forth. So then the swine fever issues swept across the Caribbean. Um, the United States arranged with Duvalier and his Tonta Makuts to really just to kill every pig. Mm. And uh, so that was another super disaster that struck the Haitian people to be de deprived of their pigs. They tried to hide them. They, a bunch of, anyway, lots of stories about the pigs. Um, and, and then the United States tried to repopulate with, um, with nice white American pigs that all required a concrete mm. uh, home to sleep in and <laughs> food that would be brought mm. would be imported. Oh yeah, and that's all <laughs> documented in Haiti's piggy bank. <laughs> it's a very frustrating place. <laughs> for those well, so is the United States. <laughs> well, well in not the same. Well, see, I see it. It seems to me that there's a connection that makes everybody's life miserable in the third world, and that's the superpowers, you know, in general, well, to, you know, to extent it. and to be thinking about that, that maybe without the exploitation of Haiti by France and then the United States, things might be a whole lot better. The other Caribbean or other Caribbean countries now have was in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands for quite some time. Now there's another peachy dandy government at work. But you know, there that was St. Thomas was a major slave trading mm -hmm. port during those years of those centuries there. And they have, as many other Caribbean countries have evolved into self respectable, somewhat respectable, self-governing models. And but Haiti has failed to do so, you know. Where, uh, well, certainly Haiti's larger than St. Thomas, but it's just sort of, I mean, I could pick other Caribbean countries to talk about and compare as well. It just seems that Haiti's never been able to really rise above the challenges uh, presented to it. It's lack of accountability. Well, one thing, and then here, and this is where I can get on with you about it, with America in comparison to the United States is if you don't educate your people, <laughs> then, then that's where you win your battles. You keep everybody dumbing down and they can't do anything. And you know, I was telling Robin, we were talking, so you know how many of those people, the, the, the upper class of Haitians, they don't even live in Haiti full time. They're all in Miami yeah. and Texas and all these other places. They don't even live in Haiti half the time. You know, they've got guards outside of their houses, they've got maids inside of their houses, and if you're a lucky Haitian, you get to be employed by one of those people who will help take care of your family and send your kids to school. And outside of that, your choice the choice for the average Haitian, um, the middle class is very, very small in Haiti, and so the rest of the population is left uh, this big with the, uh, can't read and write. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm really sad that a woman isn't here tonight who has traveled to Haiti a lot, June Levinson. Mm -hmm. Do any of you know her? Yeah, know. Uh, she used to live in Burlington. She now lives in Brattleboro. She maintains completely with a small grant and some of her own money a uh, garden project at schools in Haiti. And so she employs, pays the salary of uh, several agronomists who go around to the different schools, and apparently some of them are up there near Cape mm -hmm. Haitian. Yeah. And she goes down there um, uh, herself. She, um, you know, she sleeps in the homes of uh, her agronomists, sometimes on the floor, she tells me. She travels on their motorcycles. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is one of the most grassroots, um, uh, creating a grassroots little, um, NGO that has survived through her through her grit and determination, and she couldn't get up here uh, today, unfortunately. But uh, she would have some good stories to tell if she was here. Mm -hmm. well,
And so, I'm, and I'd like uh, Doreen to say something, my my partner in filmmaking, <laughs> and visitor uh, to Haiti so many times, uh, and that um, that we we do have a project with with some of the artwork from the animated film that we made in Haiti. And turn off my did you did you bring any copies of that film? Yes. It's a terrific little film. Have anybody seen it? No. I have seen it. It's yeah. terrific. Really? Oh, it's a lot of fun. Rock yeah. doesn't take enough credit for yeah. it. I like Black Dawn. Yeah. Yes. 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 It's interesting. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's so we, did this film, I mean, I was, I've, I've just been doing an interview with Seven Days, and we were talking. Um, I'm Dorian Craft. Robin and I made films together for a decade. And, um, you know, this film really had a wonderful life. And by that, I mean that it, the French embassy loved this little movie. It's 20 minutes, it's animated, it's the history and mythology of Haiti. And they loved it, and so they put it in every embassy in the world. <laughs> and so it had this, like, it, crazy, like, we never made any money with any films that mm -hmm. we made. Mm -hmm. And this little movie just kind of, like, had feet all over the place and traveled far and wide. And, um, and several languages. And several languages. And, you know, one of the things that Robin, when she went back to Haiti uh, last year, and we lost communication with Robin, and yes. all of us were right. mm -hmm. going out of our minds and calling the senator's office <laughs> and um, trying to figure out where you were until we got contact. One of the missions was to figure out how to bring all of the original artwork that was created for this movie to bring it back to Haiti. Um, they're just they're gorgeous, gorgeous mm -hmm. artwork mm -hmm. by artists that are beloved by mm -hmm. Haiti, mm -hmm. and many of them have died since mm -hmm. that time. And we've wanted to do this for a long time, and of course, have probably waited t till it's well. At this point, it's not doable because there isn't an institution to work with to think about creating some kind of not just security for them, but just care mm -hmm. and preservation mm -hmm. and the ability to share them. I mean, we want them to be with the Haitian people. So what is that? And the Santra Dar, which mm -hmm. we worked with for many years in um, creating this project and others, um, that doesn't exist any longer. Um, it sounds like from the stories tonight that maybe a hospital is maybe mm -hmm. the only place that has withstood the test of time for being a valid mm -hmm. center for mm -hmm. receiving mm -hmm. this and for the ability of people to be able to go there to mm -hmm. see it themselves. And so that's a project where... Yeah, air conditioning as well. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so that's a project that's on our um, agenda together mm -hmm. um, to try to figure that out. And so where's the artwork now? It's at Robbins. <laughs> My basement. <laughs> I well, I can go beautifully frame with people glass. Yeah, in the hospital. Oh, yeah, the, in the Rue Frere, the Rue Frere Community Hospital, the Hoodie Court family. I talked to you a little bit about them. That's when I went down there. It, 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 the Virgin Islands was one of the first responders to the earthquake because they could get small airplanes into small landing fields outside oh. of Port au Prince. Mm -hmm. And so, one of the, of course, the hospitals were. The center of attention and um, the, uh, I can't remember the exact name of the hospital, but the Houdicourt family started the hospital. It's like Ruferrer Hospital, basically. And it's a, it would be appropriate for that sort of thing, big center kind of hallway, you know, big square place with walls and stuff where people can, things could be hung, people could watch and see. And yeah, I'd be happy to they're, share that. They're very joyful. Most yeah, of them, perfect. of the pieces, um, and mm. you know, hospitals are beginning more and more to understand the importance and the role of art in healing.